Um, so welcome to the Epsilon Delta Seminar. Um, so today we're going to be just doing Epsilon Delta proofs. Okay? More examples of Epsilon Delta proofs because I know that this is a topic which a lot of students find uh, is quite difficult. They see it for the first time, they struggle maybe a bit with it. Um, so AMAX decided to hold a seminar exclusively for this subject. Okay? Um, I hope everybody came prepared with questions because I came prepared with nothing. In fact, I just woke up with 10 minutes ago, so I don't know how to see that. All right? Um, so, does anybody have any questions? Epsilon delta proofs that we'd like to go over. Yes? Can we pick up as limit x approaches to from the right side root for f of 17 plus 5? Okay, great. We have our first problem. Problem number one, the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side of root 4x plus 17, was it? Yeah. Okay. And we want to prove that that equals 25. Okay? Or sorry, yeah, 5. The thing inside the root is going to be 25. All right, let's do the proof. I'll be writing down over here. Down our three left statements. How much is the podium blocking? Like, can you guys see if I write down here? From here, yeah. From here, yeah. Probably from the bottom, no. I'll try to stop maybe a little bit before. Okay? All right, so how should any limit proof begin? With our three let statements, right? Let's maybe write down the definition first, and then we'll write down the let statements. So in order to prove a statement like this, what we want to show is that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that um, whenever zero is less than x minus two in absolute values, we have that f of x, in this case, the square root of four x plus 17, minus five being less than epsilon. Okay? Now because our limit is taken from the right side, we will need to modify the definition a little bit. We won't have these absolute values here, okay? But other than that, nothing changes. So this is what we want to show is true, okay? So what is our proof going to look like? Well, we're going to let epsilon greater than zero be given, okay? That's going to be our starting point. We want to show that this statement holds for all epsilon, so it only makes sense that we begin our proof by saying, well, let epsilon be arbitrary, or let it be given to us, okay? The proof that will now follow is going to work for all epsilon. So let epsilon greater than zero be given, and we're going to show that there exists a particular delta, which makes this work. So let delta equal something. I'm not going to tell you what yet. We're going to figure that out once we start doing the proof, okay? So let delta equal something, we're going to fill that in, it's going to be in terms of epsilon, um, and we'll see what it is a bit later, okay? Uh, what else do we need to let? We need to let this side of the implication be satisfied, right? We need to let 0 less than x minus 2 less than delta, x satisfying this thing, be given to us, okay? And then we're going to show that, well, the x that satisfies this also is going to satisfy that. That's how we show that an implication is true. We suppose that the first side is true, and then we show that the second side here has to follow. Okay? So, um, let x satisfy 0 less than x minus 2 less than delta be given. Okay? There we go. Epsilon greater than zero is given. Our proof will work for all epsilon. We're going to pick a specific delta, showing that one exists. We're going to let x satisfying this first half of the implication be given. Okay? That'll show that for all x which satisfies that. This will be satisfied. This is the very last step that we're going to do. Okay? And we're going to do this all in one line here. So let's begin with our abs root 4x plus 17 minus 5. And we're going to want to show that this being less than epsilon follows. All right? Now, step one in these limit proofs is always to do some algebra. Okay? We want to take this expression, this f of x minus l, mess around with it a bit, and make it look like 
an expression that involves this given information. Okay, so we want to do some algebra and then bring this thing into the picture. We know something about we know something about x minus two, that quantity. We know it's between zero and delta. Okay, so whenever you have a square root, uh, the first thing you might choose to do would be what would it be actually? Maybe I should ask you guys. What is the first thing that you should do here? What kind of algebra might you might you do? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, multiply through by the conjugate. Okay, so we want to somehow remove the square root, right? We want to get rid of the square root because our hope is that the x minus 2 quantity might come out if we do that. So let's get rid of the square root first. Let's multiply root 4x plus 17 minus 5 by the conjugate in absolute values, which is root 4x plus 17 plus 5. Okay, so we're going to multiply by the conjugate uh, and also divide by the conjugate as well to keep everything equal. Okay, there we go. Uh, and now in numerators, we can put these two absolute values together, right? Abs, something times an abs of something else is just abs of the product of the two things, right? The absolute value splits over the product like that. So we can combine these two, multiply this out. We get the first thing squared minus the second thing squared, okay? So the top actually becomes 4x plus 17, okay? The square root gets squared, okay? The middle terms cancel out. This is a difference of squares. We subtract away 5 squared, or 25. All right? And now we're going to divide that by this quantity here, the root 4x plus 17 plus 5 in absolute values. Now, in the denominator, we really don't need that absolute value because the square root is always positive. The 5 is certainly positive. So we might as well drop the abs away from the, from the denominator. Uh, and of course, the numerator here simplifies, right? 17 minus 25 is negative 8, okay? So the numerator here is 4x minus 8, and then a common factor of 4 comes out. So actually, we can write 4 times x minus 2 over here, divided by root 4x plus 17 plus 5 like that, okay? And now, x minus 2 pops up. Well, what do you know? That's exactly what we were hoping would happen, right? We wanted the x minus 2 to come out because we know something about its size. We know that it can be made less than delta. We also know that it's positive, so we know that we could drop these absolute values away, right? So let's do that and say that this is equal to 4 times x minus 2, no absolute value now, divided by root 4x plus 17 plus 5, okay? And now the x minus 2 is, first of all, it's greater than 0. We know that already. It's less than delta. So we can replace the x minus 2 here with delta, and we'll be almost done our proof. So we can say that this is now less than 4 times, and now we do our replacement. Delta pops in, divided by root 4x plus 17 plus 5. And now, we're close to being done. We have our delta inside the proof, okay? But we haven't replaced all the x's yet. We would like to find a way to get rid of these x's here in the denominator, okay? Because now, once we have replaced, once we have used our given information, here we replace the x minus 2 that popped out with delta. We put in our less than sign, we did our replacement. At this point, once we have replaced all of our x's, with either constants or things involving delta, then we can set that quantity equal to epsilon and then figure out which delta we need to make that work, okay? So at this point, we can't set this equal to epsilon yet because we have that pesky x at the bottom there, okay? The x is a variable. We have to get rid of it first, right? x is any number satisfying this inequality. So the x varies, so we can't just set delta equal to an epsilon expression involving x, okay? We can't have the x in there. So, um, any suggestions on what to do here? We want to find a way to get rid of this x in the denominator. Does anyone have an idea? Yes? Can we get rid of the 5 first? Yeah, we can totally get rid of the 5. But the 5 isn't bothering us that much. Maybe we should get rid of the square root instead, right? Look at this. Look what I'm going to do here. I'm going to say that this is less than 
4 delta over 5. I'm going to get rid of that entire square root, okay? Because whatever root 4x plus 17 is, it's something which is positive, right? When x, x starts out at 0, or sorry, at 2, if you bring the 2 over, okay? So this quantity over here is at least root 25, or it's at least 5, okay? It's at most, what? Root 4 times 2 plus delta, plus 17, okay? In any case, it's greater than 0. Okay. If you really wanted to, you could put the less than or equal to sign here instead. Okay? So this thing is positive. We might as well forget about it. We forget about something that's positive being added to the denominator. We make the denominator smaller, which makes the entire expression bigger. Okay? So this is indeed bigger than this for all the x's which satisfy that. Okay? So we can just drop that entire term and not worry about it. All right? Now over here, we have 4 delta over 5. Now we only have constants. We don't have any x's anymore. We can set that expression equal to epsilon and then rearrange and solve for delta. Okay, so this step is justified uh, because root 4x plus 17 is bigger than 0 all the time, bigger than or equal to x. The square root always returns positive things. Okay? And now we can say that, well, this is now going to be equal to 4 fifths times uh, 5 over 4 epsilon, which is epsilon, the proof is going to be finished as long as we choose delta to be uh, 5 over 4 epsilon. Okay? There we go. Any questions about that? Yes? So we can just draw some That's right. That's right. See, in these proofs, the more you drop, the better. So here we dropped the entire square root. We could have dropped other things too. Do you have a question? Can you like make the four like a hundred? Well, yeah, of course. In fact, in fact, let's make this proof a little bit better. So, so this proof works. Okay, this is correct. Um, but now let's inst instead of making four equal to a hundred, um, let's erase this line over here and say that well. This expression here, delta equals 5 over 4 epsilon, that doesn't look too nice because I don't like the 5 over 4, okay? We can always say that this is now less than delta, and delta is now going to be set equal to epsilon, okay? Right? 4 over fifths delta is less than delta. We replace the 4 at the top of 5, okay? So now we can just change that, say that, well, let delta be epsilon. <laughs> See, serving limits is easy. <laughs> Anything you do. Um, yeah, so as long as your string of inequalities is satisfied, um, we're good, right? Each of these inequalities is satisfied. That's certainly true, right? Why is this true? By the given information. Okay? This is our given info. This stuff over here is just algebra. It, all of that is just algebra, okay? That's all algebra. This is our given information, right at this step over here. This step over here comes from uh, recognizing that this root is always positive. And then this step is just here because we want to simplify the expression for delta, okay? And say that it's just epsilon, okay? Um, so yeah, as long as your inequality works, the proof, the proof is okay. All right? I know, it looks almost too easy. You can replace, you can drop whatever you want, you can do replacements, whatever. This proof works, okay? We have found a delta uh, which works for any given epsilon, right? What we have here is epsilon greater than zero starts out being given. Let me just explain this one more time. Uh, this will show that our proof will work for all epsilon. Uh, then we're going to find a specific value for delta. Delta is going to be equal to epsilon here. So we show that there exists a delta. We show that there exists a delta such that this implication holds, meaning for all x which satisfies this, the x is going to satisfy this expression as well. So we suppose that the first inequality is satisfied, and then we show that the second one is for our particular choice of delta. Our choice of delta comes in right at the end here. Okay? Yes? 
if it was approaching two from both sides instead of just the right side, how would you deal with the absolute values over x minus two? Excellent question. Excellent question. Let's change this. Let's remove the positive side. Okay? We're going to remove the positive side, and now look at this. Not everything needs to be erased. I'm going to erase some stuff, but not everything. I'm going to erase the stuff at the end here. Okay? Uh, what else needs to be erased? Everything, I guess, from here. Okay? This stuff can be left. Okay? Ah, and I'm going to put the absolute value. Okay? So now we've changed the question. We now have a two sided limit. Okay? X is approaching two from both sides. Right? Um, so at this point over here, uh, the steps would be almost the same, okay, as in the previous question. X minus two in absolute values, we wouldn't be dropping the absolute values away now because we have to have them, okay? But we know that abs X minus two is less than delta. So at this point, we can make our replacement. We can say that this is less than four times delta over root four X plus 17 plus five, okay? And now essentially the same thing we did before works. So actually I erased too much. I could have just not erased this other side, right? This is four delta over five, which is less than delta <laughs> is equal to epsilon. The proof works. And now we let delta to be equal to, trick question. What is it equal to? It could be 5 over 4 epsilon, or it could be just epsilon, okay, as we chose it here. Uh, but there's actually a, another subtle point that comes into the picture. When we remove the positive side, delta can now be negative, or sorry, delta can be, uh, x can now be less than 2, rather. Okay, so let's just draw this out really quickly, okay? 4x um, plus 17 under the root, what does that look like? Uh, take out the 4 and get root 2 plus... 17 over 4. 17 over 4 is something that's slightly bigger than 4. So the thing is going to start out somewhere over here. This would be negative 4. Somewhere over here. Negative 4.25, I think. The root's going to start out, and it's going to move uh, like this. Okay. So there's our root um, 4x plus 17. Okay. Now, we're at, we're around x. Uh, x is around 2. Okay. So where is 2? It's over here. Okay. There's 2. And now we're choosing a delta window on both sides of two, not just on one side, but on both sides. There's our delta window, for example. Where's the problem? The delta window cannot cross this point, okay? There is the point of subtlety. The delta cannot be so large that a symmetric interval around two will cross over here and be outside of the domain of the function. Because then, suppose delta could make it all the way up to negative five, the delta window x could potentially be all the way up to negative 5, or negative 4 and a half, okay? Which, if you plug into your function, you wouldn't get an answer. If you plug in negative 4.5 in here, you'd get root negative 1. So that'd be outside of our domain, okay? So we do have to specify now, because we're doing the two-directional limit, uh, that there is a maximum size for delta. So delta can't just be equal to epsilon, because what if somebody gives you a large epsilon, like 100? Then what? Delta is going to be equal to 100? No, too big. Okay? We need delta to be equal to the minimum of two things. The largest that delta can possibly be is the distance from 2 to the edge of the domain here, which is 6.25. So we have to put that in. 6.25 comma epsilon. Okay? Now, if somebody chooses a large epsilon for you, if you're given a very large epsilon, delta will not be chosen to be that big. It will be 6.25, if our epsilon happens to be bigger than that. Okay? So there is now a maximum size for delta that's specified. Right? So that's a very good question. And this is a bit of a subtle point, although I'm pretty sure that if this question was on an exam, uh, nobody would really notice the domain thing. Um, but if you really want it to be formal, you would need to put that in, okay? Um, one more thing, I don't like the 6.25 because I don't like decimals. Let's remove them. Done. That works as well. Now we're just saying that the delta window can't be bigger than, you can't get all the way up to negative four, okay? Really, any number less than 6.25 would be okay here. 
If I don't like six, I could put one. Okay? That's good enough too. As long as there is a maximum size of delta that's specified and that maximum size is not larger than 6.25. What is the distance from the point we're considering to the edge of the domain? Any questions about that? Yes? If uh, the limit was x approaches 2 from the smaller side, the absolute value would turn into negative. There'd be a negative. Mm, if we were approaching, OK, so let's now do the third case. If we have this, OK, then um, this would be the case. We would have negative delta less than x minus 2 less than 0, OK? Well, we could still say that this would hold, OK? Nothing would change here. The absolute value here, x minus 4, which comes out, would still be less than, uh, this, sorry, x minus 2 and absolute values would still be less than delta, OK? So actually, nothing would change there, OK? Uh, we would have to have the maximum size of delta specified as well, because now if we're approaching from the left side, then deltas are going to look like this, or delta windows are going to look like that. They're going to start at 2, OK? They're going to go over to the left. Okay? So here we would need a maximum size of delta. Okay, anything else? I think we're pretty much done with this example. Unless someone has one more question. Okay, cool. Any other examples you want to do? Any other questions? Yes? Okay, so let me erase some of this. Okay, I'm going to erase the function. I'm going to leave the let statement so I don't have to rewrite it. Limit as x approaches 30 of? Infinity. infinity. Oh, infinity. OK, cool. Infinity of? x over x plus 1 equals 1. x over x plus 1 equals 1. OK, let's do that. What we're going to do is we're going to show that for all epsilon greater than 0, there's going to exist an n now. So I'm going to take delta away, erase it, and replace it with n. There's going to exist an n greater than 0, such that x larger than n, x larger than n, is going to imply f of x minus the limit be less than epsilon. So f of x in this case is x over x plus 1 minus the limit, which is 1. We're going to show this. OK? So let's do it. Let's get rid of this. OK? Let's get rid of all of this. And let's get rid of that. So what do we need? x bigger than n here. Okay? We need to let that be given. Maybe you should move the given over. There we go. Be given. Okay? Whoa. Okay. There we go. So We've changed the definition to be the limit as x goes to infinity definition. We're not looking for a delta now, we're looking for an n, OK? Uh, but other than that, the definition is very, very similar, OK? For all epsilon greater than 0, we're going to show that there exists an n such that this implies this. For all x which satisfy this statement, this statement will follow. So we're letting x, epsilon greater than 0 be given. We're going to let n equal something that works. And we're going to figure out what that is later on. And we're going to let x satisfy this, the first piece here in our implication, be given. And now we're going to show that x over x plus 1 minus 1 can indeed be made less than epsilon with our particular choice of n, which is going to be chosen later. All right? So step one in the limit proofs is to write these lines. Maybe there's a question that will come up on the final which you really won't know how to do. Okay? Write the first three lines. Write the definition. Okay? That's like a free mark right there, depending on who's marking it. So if it's me, then no. But, but I won't be marking the finals. <laughs> okay? Um, so there we go. Write down the first three lines. That's always step one. Step two is do some algebra. Anything. Okay? Usually, if you have a fraction, the first thing you do is common denominator. If you have a square root, the first thing you do is conjugate it. Okay? Usually it's pretty clear what to do. If you have a polynomial, you just simply subtract, like a quadratic, and then factor. Okay? So if you do a couple different examples of each kind, you pretty much know what to do. Okay? Unless, you know, there's something pathological here. But let's not worry about that. Alright, so x over x minus 1. 
x plus 1 minus 1 equals what? Common denominator of this. This is abs x over x plus 1 minus, I'm going to write the 1 as x plus 1 over x plus 1. And now we can subtract out the numerators, and what are we going to get? Negative 1 at the top. So this is negative 1 over x plus 1. Okay? And now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move the absolute value into the numerator and into the denominator. I'm going to split it over this fraction. Okay? And of course, abs negative 1 is just 1. All right? And now we can drop the absolute value from the denominator. We can say that this is equal to x plus 1. Okay? Why? Because x plus 1 is positive. Why? Because x is positive. Why? Because x is bigger than n, and n is bigger than 0. Okay? So n is bigger than 0, x is bigger than n, and so x is positive, so x plus 1 is always positive. Good. We got rid of the absolute value. When doing a proof involving limits going off to infinity, usually you can get rid of the absolute value, okay? Somewhere along the way. In this case, right away, almost. Okay? All right, so we've gotten rid of... Uh, the absolute value, and now we have 1 over x plus 1. What do, you, what do we think we should do now? So at this point, step, step 2 is done. The algebra is finished. We can no longer do any more algebra here. Okay? Now we can start moving with our less than signs. We can start dropping stuff and replacing it with simple stuff. Okay? So do, does anyone see anything we can drop? Yes? Drop the 1. Sure. Why not? Let's get rid of it. This is less than better less than, less than 1 over x. Cool, the 1 is now gone. Now what can we do? Now we, we really can't get anything simpler than this, okay? We have 1 over x here. We know something about the size of x. We know that x is bigger than n, okay? If x is bigger than n, 1 over x is less than 1 over n. Just take this inequality here and flippity-flip both sides. The inequality sign also flippity-flips. It points the other way now which is great because that's the way we want it to point. We want to now say that this is less than 1 over capital N. And now we've replaced all of our variables with constants or n's. Okay? So step 3 is now done. Now we have step 4, which is actually equating the constant here, the capital N, to epsilon, and then solving for the n that works. In this case, it's super simple, and it's just 1 over epsilon. So set that equal to 1 over 1 over epsilon, which is equal to epsilon square. Okay, proof is done. So what must capital N be? 1 over epsilon. Done. Look how easy that is. Any questions about that? Yes. Yeah, if x is bigger than n, then 1 over x is certainly less than 1 over n, right? Like if x is, you can always justify by plugging in some numbers, right? 200 is bigger than 100. 1 over 200, 1 200 is less than 100, okay? Yeah, you can always choose a specific x and specific n variable. That's, all right, did we have to drop the 1? No, we didn't have to drop the 1, okay? We could have just replaced the x straight away with n, okay? That's also possible. And then we could set that equal to epsilon. So in this case, we would need n to be chosen to be 1 over epsilon minus 1, plus 1, and that's going to be epsilon there, okay? The proof would now end, and n would have to be 1 over epsilon minus 1. Okay? So that works as well. The reason why I don't really like this method is because, first of all, uh, it's not simple enough, okay? There, it, it is possible to be simpler, and this, anytime it's possible to be simpler, it's best to actually be simpler, okay? Rather than drag this one over. Another reason is, uh, what if the epsilon that's given here is not very big? So one over epsilon minus one that might evaluate to something which ends up being negative, right? Like if the epsilon that was given to you was like 1.5, 1 over 1.5 minus 1 
is going to be something negative, okay? Uh, but n is not supposed to be negative, it's supposed to be positive. So in this case, if we want to delete this group, we would have to consider that possibility of the epsilon not being too large, right? Then we would need to choose n to be uh, the maximum of either, well, you would need to throw some of that information in there, that if, that if this ends up being negative, uh, we're not choosing um, n to be 1 over epsilon minus 1. Instead, we're going to choose it to be something positive like 1, okay? So we would need a maximum statement here, 1 over epsilon minus 1, say, and 1. Why not? Okay? Depending on the size of epsilon. Okay? That's just to satisfy this little criterion here. Would we have to do the same if we, uh, if we just did it the other way? Like if you had 1 over x? Yeah, no, no. The other way is better than this way. Yeah. First, don't we have to also do like a maximum of 1 and 1 over epsilon? Like if that was the case? No, no, because epsilon is always positive. Right? If n is set equal to 1 over epsilon, 1 over epsilon is always positive because epsilon is positive. So n is always going to be a number bigger than 0, and it's going to work. The, the reason why we need this statement here is because 1 over epsilon minus 1 might be less than 0. And we want to make sure that it isn't. So if this thing actually ends up evaluating to be less than 1, instead of choosing that, we're going to choose 1. Okay? We could have replaced the 1 here with any other number, as long as it's positive, because n has to be positive. Okay? So not 0, for instance, but any other positive number would be, would be fine. Okay? In this case, if the epsilon we choose is smaller than a half, okay, uh, then this quantity would win. Okay? If the epsilon we choose is less than a half, uh, 1 over something less than a half is something less than 2, minus 1 will be something less than 1, and we would choose the 1. The 1 would win in that case. Okay? So for epsilons which are not that small, the 1 would win. For really tiny epsilon, this quantity would win. Okay? All right. You guys want to do another example? Who has a suggestion? Yes? Um, what happens if x goes to negative infinity? Oh, what? great question. What happens when x goes to negative infinity? Um, what happens is we need to change the definition. Okay? Uh, so if this problem said x goes to negative infinity, okay? x over x plus 1 equals 1. Actually, this statement is true as well. Even if x goes to negative infinity, this is true. Um, we would need to change these inequality signs, right? So for the positive limit, we're saying that for any epsilon distance uh, away from the limit, we can make the function minus the limit that small, okay, less than epsilon, as long as we choose x is sufficiently large, or larger than n for some n, which we're going to show that exists. Um, now x is tending to negative infinity. So we want to show that for all epsilon greater than 0, the function minus the limit can be made less than epsilon as long as the x's are chosen to be negative enough or less than any chosen, or less than some chosen negative number n. Okay, so this time there exists an n greater than z, uh, less than 0, that's what we're going to have here, uh, such that for all x less than n, even more or less than n, that implication is going to hold. So, let's actually do the proof, since most of it is done anyway. So, let's get rid of this stuff over here, okay? Uh, what needs to be changed? This is okay, this is okay. X satisfying X less than N, okay? So, this is the definition for uh, negative infinity limits, okay? Neg infinity limits. Okay? There we go. So, uh, let X satisfying X less than capital N be given and capital N is less than zero, okay? <coughs> so, let's do this. Let's show that x over x plus one minus one is less than epsilon. The first step remains unchanged. Second step is fine, okay? The third step is fine. Uh, the fourth step is not fine, actually. We can't drop the absolute value here. Why? Because the x's are now negative, okay? So actually, over here is where we need to erase and replace, okay? We have one over abs x plus one. And now x's are negative, right? They're more negative than n, which is itself negative, okay? Whenever x is less than negative one here, this quantity within the abs value 
is negative, okay? So um, usually we're going to have that happen. Like usually if x is tending to negative infinity, then usually the x's are going to be less than uh, negative 1, right? They're going to be big negative numbers, okay? So let's just change the sign over here. Let's say that this is um, equal to 1 over negative x plus 1, okay? Uh, and this is because the x's are usually negative here, okay? x plus 1, uh, less than 0 usually, okay? And so the absolute value is going to return uh, the negative of the quantity, okay? If this thing here within the absolute values is negative, then what does the absolute value give? The positive part, so it changes the sign, okay? And now we want to use this information along the way, okay? So what do you think we should do over here at this step? Yes? Can you start dropping? Yeah, you can start dropping stuff. So what do you think should be dropped? So notice that we have, what, what do we have over here? 1 over negative x minus 1, OK? So we have negative x. Now, this is a positive quantity, OK? However, we're subtracting 1. So we can't really drop that quickly, OK? Actually, at this step, what would be better than to do this uh, would be to reuse reverse triangular equality. Okay? Um, so notice that the 1 here cannot be dropped. Why can't the 1 be dropped? It's a negative, OK? If you take this 1 away, you have 1 over um, here something which is positive, OK? You're subtracting 1. If you drop that negative 1, you're all of a sudden making the denominator larger, which doesn't make the fraction larger, it makes it smaller. So our inequality will point uh, the other way, OK? That's not good. So there are two ways of dealing with this. Uh, one way would be to use reverse triangle inequality. One would be to replace the 1 with something else, OK? Which do you guys want? OK, let's, let's try the replacement method first, OK? So here we're going to try to replace uh, negative 1 with something, OK? So this will sort of be on the side. The proof will still continue up here, but we're going to replace the negative 1 with something. What do you think we should replace it with? Maybe something involving an x so that the two combine nicely. Let's replace negative 1 because here we assume that x plus 1 was less than 0. So implicit in this equality here was the assumption that x is less than negative 1. Okay? So if x is less than negative 1, okay, then we can replace negative 1 with what? I mean, if x is less than negative 1, 1 over x here is larger than 1 over negative 1. Okay? So adding anything over here would make this larger. Um, of course, if we uh, changed x over here, if we put in a 2, right? If x is, if x is less than negative 1, then x is certainly less than, uh, then 2x is certainly less than negative 1, okay? No, we're going to need a stronger statement here. Let's make x over 2. Uh, huh, I'm getting screwed up here with the negative signs. Okay, so negative x is positive, right? the 1 here, so we have the thing which is positive, okay? And now we're going to subtract away less, okay? So we're going to subtract away, let's say we're going to subtract away um, negative x over 2, okay? Let's see if that's going to work. Yeah, yeah, this, this works. So this will be neg 1 over negative x over 2. There we go. Okay? so. Let's get rid of this. Let's justify this step. Okay. Uh, so first of all, this one is okay when x is less than negative 1. And here, um, we have our 1 over negative x minus 1. So the negative x is going to be a positive quantity. We're subtracting 1 from it. Instead of subtracting the value 1, we're going to subtract away the value negative x over 2. Okay. So we replaced 1 with something just in terms of x. Um, and then this will work as long as uh, the negative x over 2 here is a larger quantity, because this is a positive quantity, is a larger quantity than the 1. 
then we're subtracting away the larger quantity, um, and that makes the denominator smaller, which makes the entire fraction bigger. There we go. That's confusing. Can everyone understand this step here? So this holds when x is less than negative 2. Okay? Here we have a positive quantity, minus 1. Okay? We're replacing the minus 1 with something in terms of x. The reason for this is we want this to combine nicely, and now we have just a single term without a subtraction in the denominator. Okay? So we replaced minus 1 with minus something which is larger than 1. Okay? Negative x over 2 is going to be larger than 1 whenever x is even smaller than the negative 2. Okay? So we replace negative 1 with, we replace the 1 with a larger positive, so we're subtracting a larger positive, which makes the denominator uh, smaller, which makes the entire fraction bigger when we reciprocate. That's confusing as hell. But anyway, um, let's finish this off. So this is going to be uh, negative 2 over x, okay? Um, and now we can use our given information. So if x uh, is even more or less than negative n, okay, uh, then we can say that here uh, we can reverse this and say, well, 1 over x is going to be bigger than 1 over n, or that negative 1 over x is going to be less than negative 1 over n. If we multiply through by the negative, this becomes less than uh, 2 over n, Okay, and now we can set that equal to epsilon, and I missed, there's a minus sign which was missed. Yeah, see, this is the reason why I don't like the negative infinity limits, but that's alright, because we're going to see why, uh, we're going to see how in a minute we can change all the negative infinity questions to positive infinity questions, so this problem will be solved. Uh, but at this step, yeah, this is, this is too complicated, let's just set this equal to n right away. <laughs> so in this case, so in this case, the dropping part doesn't really work, okay? Um, so we have negative x minus 1, okay? Um, x is less than n, uh, and so what is that telling us? That's telling us that um, 1 plus x is less than 1 plus n, or that 1 over 1 plus x is greater than 1 over 1 plus n, or uh, that negative 1 over 1 plus x is less than negative 1 over 1 plus n. Okay, so we can say that this is less than negative 1 over 1 plus n. And now we can set that equal to epsilon. Okay, so what must n be? We have to have negative 1 here over 1 plus, and now what do we need? 1 plus something which will simplify to epsilon. So how about negative 1 over epsilon minus 1? Okay? The negative ones here will cancel out, the epsilon will come up to the top, the negatives will cancel out, and we're going to get epsilon over here, and n has to be what? Negative 1 over epsilon minus 1, which is a negative value, because epsilon is positive. Okay? Cool. So that works. Wow, that gave me a headache, actually. Um, so the proof is finally done, okay? The replacement method doesn't really work here, um, but that's fine because this, this works. Um, now let's talk about how we can avoid these kinds of problems in the future. Um, check this out. We have a little theorem over here. Maybe I should put it over here on this board. We have a little theorem for changing limits that go to negative infinity into limits which go to positive infinity. Okay? You can prove this yourselves. It's very easy. It's just messing around with the definitions. The limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x, proving that this limit is equal to L, is the same thing as proving that the limit as x approaches infinity of f of negative x equals L. Okay? So, so we can change this problem into a problem as x goes to positive infinity. Okay? Because the inequalities here could get complicated. Like they got over here with you know, you have to keep in mind always that x is negative, n is negative, then when you're setting n equal to an epsilon expression, there will be an explicit negative sign in there because epsilon is positive. Everything gets a bit harder. Um, it's a lot easier to deal with the positive infinity limits where everything is positive. So my suggestion to you would be, instead of showing this, to show this. So 
it's literally one or two lines to show that the definition for this becomes the definition for this, okay? Just take this definition over here um, and apply it now to, uh, then write down the definition for the positive limit going off negative x over negative x plus one, and then there'll be like one step in between to show why the two are equal, okay? Uh, just a little switch of the inequalities, all right? Um, so this example's finally done. Phew, I did it. I didn't have to admit that I didn't know a question. Any questions about this? Yes? Just the, the, what's the gear way of get, getting, you know how you got negative one over epsilon minus one? Mm -hmm. What's your quick way of getting that? What's a quick way of getting that? This? Yeah. Yeah, so you could just set, so at this point over here, I just sort of guessed this value. Um, we could have just set this equal to epsilon and then tried to rearrange for n. So, right, cross multiply here. So we get negative one over epsilon equals one plus n, and then n is negative one over epsilon minus one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that. Okay. So reverse triangle inequality. Um, triangle inequality says that a plus b is less than abs a plus abs b. So abs a plus b is less than abs a plus abs b. Uh, reverse triangle, any, or less than or equal to. Reverse triangle inequality says that abs a minus b is greater than or equal to abs a minus abs b. Okay, so this is triangle inequality. The way I write this one is like this. Okay, reverse triangle inequality. Um, this is handy for getting upper bounds on one over a quantity. Okay? Because here if we do one over both sides over here, the inequality flips. Okay? Uh, this is handy for proving that, say, one over x is continuous, which I guess we could do that example too. Okay? So the, the reverse triangle inequality, inequality is handy if you have like a rational function and there is some x's in the denominator and you're trying to get an upper bound on that. Okay? So, We'll probably see an example where uh, we'll need to use that, okay? Um, in this example, essentially, the, the x plus 1 over here, we could have rewritten that as 1 minus negative x, and then applied reverse triangle inequality to that now. We have the negative x being positive. We have a difference between the two terms, a minus between the two terms now. And we could have used that reverse triangle inequality to say that that's going to be now less than 1 over, say, 1 minus the abs of negative x. Okay? And now that the one is positive, we could drop the one. Um, yeah, this is perhaps, this method would be, would be the best probably for this particular example. Okay? No need to bring reverse triangle inequality into the picture. Um, we'll probably see another example where reverse triangle inequality will be used. Uh, do we need like a two minute break or something? Sure. Okay, let's do a two minute break. And then when we get back, we'll prove uh, that some rational function is continuous and we're actually going to use this, this inequality here to help us. Yeah.